going to have everyone take their seats. We have a full agenda today, so we want to make sure that we get to that. And uh, the clerk will note the roll. We do have a quorum, so we'll be able to go ahead and get started. And Representative Brand, would you like to move the minutes of January 22nd? Yes, Madam Chair, would love to do that. All right, are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, then all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. So um, today we are going to um, talk about mental health and talk about stress of farming. And um, we have a few bills that we will be hearing as well and we'll have some testimony uh, for that. Um, the Department of Agriculture is going to be able to kind of set the stage for us today. Um, for all of us, we've heard about um, the ag economy and how things are impacting people in our communities and, our, and throughout our state. And we certainly have heard about um, rural mental health, suicide, um, depression, um, accidents, many things that are happening that are impacting farmers and producers. And so today we wanted to um, spend some time on that. Certainly Tuesday kind of set the stage as well when we heard about dairy farmers and heard about how things are um, happening within that sector of agriculture, but we have um, the entire sector of agriculture feeling some stress and some anxiety around um, a variety of things. So today we're going to be able to address that um, somewhat. We're not actually going to be passing bills today, but we're going to be hearing the bills and laying them over um, because we need to make sure that we're doing um, as comprehensive a, of an approach as we can, and we will certainly do that quickly, but we want to make sure that we um, start talking about the issues today. And one of those issues um, is related to uh, rural mental health uh, with Ted Matthews, and the other is farm advocates. So we're kind of concentrating on those two today. Um, so for the initial presentation, I'm just going to have the Commissioner Tom Peterson from the Department of Ag and Meg Moynihan um, come to the table and be able to kind of set the stage for us um, and talk about the department's um, <coughs> position as well on this. So welcome to the committee and introduce yourselves and then be able to uh, uh, begin. Commissioner. <coughs> Madam Chair, uh, members, uh, my name is Tom Peterson. I'm the Commissioner of Agriculture uh, for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And uh, thank you for uh, holding this really important hearing today. I, I you know, some, this is not a new issue for me, having worked uh, for Farmers Union for many years and worked with this committee over the years on farmer lender mediation, on the farm advocate program, on the counseling. Uh, but I think everybody here uh, knows that this issue has ri risen to the top. It's it you know we put the bills forward last year as, as the community and egg and and it's been hanging on for a while, and I can just tell you you know I know a lot of farmers I get a lot of calls and the holidays this year were exceptionally hard for me personally that some of the farmers I thought oh they'll never be in trouble you know and they're I you know and I think of you know really just uh, people that I think have it all together and to take calls. Uh, um, you know, it has been very difficult. And uh, so I am really pleased that we're uh, looking at this issue today. Um, I just want to talk about uh, <clears throat> really quick too that I, I am appreciative of the work that we do at the department as I've gotten into it. I think the department uh, beginning uh, within the last couple of years has really stepped up the the uh, work on this effort and I'm really pleased to be here with Meg. I think Meg is the right person to be in this job but for those of you who haven't been able to visit with Meg before or been at things with Meg, she just brings a lot and we're, uh, is a great asset to have at the department in this important time. And Meg will talk about some of the resources that we have but I also say too as you as legislators, you know, you're, you're going to get those calls too, you know, and I know that a lot of you have and um, we want you to know the resources are there and we're uh, ready to help. <clears throat> and I'm glad to have uh, Ted Matthews here today too. Um, I, you know, I took a really tough call right around Christmas time and from a farmer and um, I had a hard time like when I got done talking to him. I mean, I was like really 
uh, and it was interesting because two minutes later, Ted was my next, Ted called me. <laughs> and so I was like, Ted had to, I, it was actually kind of counseled me for a minute because I had just gone through this. But so I can just tell you as he gets up here, um, you know, the work he does is very important. The last thing before I turn over to Meg and then I'll talk more about the farm advocates too after Meg, um, the farm bill recently passed uh, Representative Emmer and Senator Smith uh, worked real hard to pass the stress act and we'll be looking at that as the uh, language uh, comes together and some of the funding and with action that your committee may take may also put us in a position to eventually leverage some of those dollars as well and so something to consider as you go forward thank you commissioner Meg. thank you good morning madam chair and good morning members my name is meg moynihan i'm a senior advisor at the minnesota department of agriculture i appreciate the uh, the commissioner's confidence and warm words um, that, especially from a new boss some of you know me um, i have been at the department for about 15 years and i started my life as the organic lady and for many years i did that um, and uh, in the past few years, my role has changed. And I will just tell you briefly that some of that came about because I am also a farmer. I'm a dairy farmer. Um, my husband and I milk about 70 cows in Lesseur County. We encountered our own farm crisis in 2016. And that resulted in me taking a leave of absence from my job at the Department of Agriculture and becoming the full-time farmer on our farm, which was quite a challenge for a girl who grew up in Milwaukee uh, and didn't have a whole lot of experience getting skid steers started at 15 below zero. And um, I had some real personal challenges, I will tell you, uh, during that time. Um, and uh, that took me to counseling. It took me to uh, some antidepressants for a while. And it also brought me into contact with my friends and neighbors and colleagues across the state who I found out were in various ways, shapes, and forms going through the same thing. And so I was really in a fortunate position to come back to the department with that experience and to find a prior administration and a current administration that is so supportive and recognizes the challenges that we're going through. I think you're aware that we have had uh, tremendously low prices across the sector for farmers for at least the past three years. Really hard to keep our heads above float. But in addition to that, that's layered on top of what I see as so many stresses and fractures and challenges that are just part of the nature of farming and the uncertainty. The weather, the insurance, the school consolidation, and now my kids have to ride an extra hour in the morning. Many of these factors. Um, last year we talked uh, at a, a committee hearing similar to this one about the pressures of regulation, and, and that happens as well. Um, and so the depth and the breadth of farmers is expanding. You're hearing from more of your constituents, we are hearing from more farmers. We are hearing from farm advocates and extension educators and lenders who are really worried um, about the farmers, the impact on farmers, farm families, but also the entire rural sector, the entire rural economy that, that connects these things. So i just tell you a few things that are going on at, at our department. We did not start by circling the wagons and saying, okay, let's develop a program. We just started doing stuff. And we looked, um, we looked around to see what existing sources of support existed that we provided, that some of our partner organizations provided, and really put our efforts into knitting those together and making them as easy and simple and navigable as possible for farmers. So it was quick to get them to sources of support, sources of, sometimes it's moral support that, that's really what's critical. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's legal. Um, if you, you, you all have a couple of brochures in front of us. One is about the Farm Advocates Program, which the commissioner is going to talk about a bit. <clears throat> but the other is our coping with farm and rural stress in Minnesota. And I think that shows you um, how we highlight some of the, the work that we're doing, the programs the MDA offers. But we've also got extension programs in there, Minnesota State FBM programs, Farmers Legal Action Group. You know, it's really a... a, a collection of resources and we do the same thing at our minnesotafarmstress.com website so there's no compartmentalization or ownership or fiefdoms here in fact i get calls from i get calls from um, people all over the country i was on a phone call with the centers for disease control last week um, and ted was on that call as well and they said how they say how is it that we hear all this stuff is going on in Minnesota to support farmers and like how are you able to to pull that together and fund it and how do you do that and I say you know I don't know we just all started doing stuff and we're we have this tradition of of working together and we're not very turfy about things and I, I believe that that has served us well and that we intend to continue along those lines um, 
I think one good example of the approach that we take in terms of connections and um, uh, expanding um, the the folks who are in a position to help farmers and recognize what's going on and assist is a, a workshop that we did last year called Down on the Farm, Supporting Farmers in Stressful Times. And that was something we put together with the help of Ted Matthews, Minnesota Sheriff's Association, Minnesota Farm Service Administration. And our premise was that the people who are in the best position to help farmers the fastest are the people that they know and that trust. Um, and so we, we delivered this program in six locations. Um, Chair Poppy, I believe, was at our Mankato location. And we talked about how do you recognize and respond when you see farmers in trouble. Um, it, we've, we attracted 475 people to that training from all kinds of different areas of expertise. Thief River Falls is a good example. Um, we had soil conservationists, farm lenders, farm mediators, farm business management instructors, nurses. Um, we had a county commissioner. We had a veterinarian all coming together saying, yes, I see my farmers struggling and I don't know how to help them. What is it that I can do? Um, that was very successful, and we're working on building off some programming off of that. Um, but what that did was, um, you know, engage people locally, but also introduce those people to each other so that they could begin to feel that they were weaving a support network for farmers in the local communities. We have a Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes if you have a deep, dark secret, it's easier to talk to somebody you don't know about it rather than admitting it to somebody that you do know. And that helpline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is uh, free of charge. It is confidential. And it has three simple options. A farmer who, or, or farm family member or someone who's worried about a farmer may call and need some emotional support. Um, and so the first option is a direct connection to First Call for Help, ITASCA, with whom we contract. Uh, and they have trained counselors who can help farmers or any of the callers work through um, the thoughts and the feelings that they're experiencing uh, and the challenges that they're going through. So that is available. The second option is uh, for the challenges of daily living. We know that sometimes uh, when revenues are down, food is scarce. The irony of farmers going hungry. We know that there are farmers who are worried about their parents and need uh, safe care for them or for children in daycare. If a, all of a sudden a spouse has to go and work off the farm, how do I find daycare for the kids? What's going to happen to them? So that connects callers to the 211 service in their region if they press that number. And the third, we know that one of the, some of the most pressing issues top of mind right now are financial, business, and legal. And so pressing that option takes callers to, right to the department. Department of Agriculture during business hours, um, and Matt McDevitt and some of his staff from the Rural Finance Authority answer that line and help people find, do they need an extension farm financial counselor? Do they need an attorney? You know, how is it that we can help them navigate quickly? Um, we are working um, a, a relatively new effort that I'm excited about is helping network agriculture communicators who um, are, have, have uh, powerful voices to their own constituencies. So we are better at coordinating and sharing and amplifying some of these really sensitive messages and topics. And we believe that um, having a diverse array of voices talking about this is, is important. You know, the, the Department of Agriculture does not need to be the bullhorn about farm stress. Um, some people put their full faith and credit in the Commissioner of Agriculture, and we certainly use his voice, but some people might find um, a statement by the President of the Farm Bureau more credible or a board member from the Minnesota Corn Growers. So we're working together so that we are sharing the work of getting these messages out in a supportive way. Um, I just want to share a couple of projects that we're in the process of launching because I think that you may be ex excited about them as I am. One is a radio outreach project that we are partnering with Don Wick and the Red River Farm Network uh, for their listening area, which is most of northwest Minnesota, uh, North Dakota, and then one lone station in South Dakota. And we're putting together some paid primetime short features that explore farm stress and coping mechanisms. So this is not all gloom and doom, but um, what are some paths uh, to success? What are some paths to resolution, to decision making? And we're emphasizing farm voices and local voices. This is not national experts that will be on. We know that people like to hear um, from folks that they've been watching in their own communities. And we're repeating them enough during prime listening time, you know, not sticking them at midnight as a paid 
public service announcement, but paid prime time, um, windshield time, working in the shop time, meal time, repeating them so farmers are more likely to hear them and talk about them with each other. We're also concerned about youth, farm and rural youth. Our Down on the Farm program targeted people who work with adult farmers, but you know farm kids are going through exactly what their parents are going through and even less able to make sense of it. So we're partnering with a therapist um, who has deep farm background, but also a licensed uh, counselor to put together a, like a mini a Down on the Farm, but for people who work with youth. So we're thinking youth pastors, um, uh, youth leaders, 4-H, FFA leaders, classroom teachers, K through 12, school counselors, to help them recognize and respond appropriately if they see farm and rural kids who are exhibiting some of these symptoms of stress and what they can do about that. The, um, these efforts, um, I, I want you to know, have, have brought us into some remarkable partnerships with other state agencies that I have personally found really gratifying. Um, at, with the Department of Health, uh, we are working with them to develop a suicide awareness and prevention training that is targeted specifically toward agriculture professionals to help get those um, the competencies out there and those resources. We're also, um, Chair Poppy, I believe, mentioned suicide earlier. We are um, starting a project with them, um, our money, their expertise, to examine existing violent death data in the state and get a better handle on how many of those may have been farm suicides because that reporting is very inconsistent county to county and we even find that is true nationwide. Nobody really has a good handle on how to capture this information and we think with better information about that we'll be in a better position to develop some prevention and intervention strategies that may work better that we certainly hope will work better. Um, with Minskew as an old and reliable partner, certainly we've, we've worked with the Farm Business Management Program for many years uh, and supported them, but we're also working with them to create a curriculum based on that Down on the Farm Program workshop that I explained so that other people can use that, so that they can use that in their own industries, in their communities. Um, the, the little delivery team of Ted and me and Randy from the Sheriff's Association can't keep traveling around and doing this over and over, but other people can do it for themselves, and so we're putting together the recipe so that they can do that. Um, at the Department of Human Services, now there's an agency that I don't know that we've really ever worked with very much, but um, willing, very um, partners, very excited about helping us learn about human services that are available in rural areas that we can help um, you know, convey that information to farmers if, if they need help with that, but also inviting us in to provide training and support in what is the farm culture, what is the farm context, and helping their staff and their community partners and their, like their mobile crisis teams sort of understand why, farm, why the farm population may be a little different um, in, in some good ways, but also in some challenging ways than people that they've served. And then finally, we have some old chestnuts that I think are, um, have been really important and continue to be critical. Um, one of those is the Minnesota Farm Advocate Program that has been around since 1984 um, with the, the vision and support of, of the legislature during this time. And the commissioner is going to talk about that. Yes, Commissioner. <clears throat> Um, Madam Chair, and real quickly on the Farm Advocate Program, is such an important program. We have 10 advocates around the state, and I think their names are in the brochure. I always think, too, it's many times the advocates are farmers themselves, mm -hmm. and I always think that's really important. And a lot of times when I, um, I, I think about uh, last summer, I was at a picnic, just to kind of tell you how this works. And an older fellow that I know is 85 years old, and he, uh, he, he wanted to talk to me. And he said, uh, uh, Tom, he said, I'm worried about my son. And uh, his, his son's 50. And I always think about that, too. You're always kind of a dad, even at 85, right? And, um, but it was really struck me because he said, I'm worried about my son. He said, I think he's thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh, he's a dairy farmer. And I thought, uh, he said, what could, we, what could we do for him? You know, and this was like a Sunday afternoon. And I said, uh, um, well, we have resources. And I said, you know, I thought about the nearby advocate. And we got his number, and he called him that afternoon. You know, and so that's what they have. It, it turned out he was 10 miles away. Um, they uh, know that the farmers knew the advocates. And that happens a lot, you know. And so a lot of times we'll do that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to say that that farmer, I know he's not dairy anymore, but he's still farming. 
and you know what they do is they you know can able to talk to them. Uh, I see it right now in bankruptcies too, where a lot of bankruptcy uh, proceedings. Sometimes the advocates, the farmer will have an idea in the back of their mind, and to just have somebody to be able to talk to them and uh, get in there is really helpful. So we have, as uh, Meg said, we have uh, uh, 10 advocates. The advocates provide one-on-one -on -one assistance for Minnesota farmers who face crisis, either by natural disaster or financial challenges. Uh, the farm, as I said, they are peer of farmers. Um, they're trained and experienced in agricultural lending process. A lot of the lenders know them. The farm mediators know them. Uh, very important. The farm counselors know them. Uh, and so I think that's, and they, they have a network of attorneys and accountants and human professionals. So they are just really able to help a lot. We served 242 uh, farmers last year. And you think about, you know, in my new role, I'm thinking, you know, we want to have everybody that wants to farm continue to farm. And so I would just say too, as we uh, look at this in 2017, we did increase the budget by uh, $20,000 per year, but talking to, and I'm sorry, Connie Dykes, we and was one of the advocates, we invited her here today. And I talked to Connie last week and I asked her how it's going and how busy you are. And, and some advocates are more busy than others, but you know, I'll say to Connie and uh, talking to Matt on our staff, uh, when they are, um, uh, when they work past their uh, allotted uh, time, they still take the calls, you know, and so they don't say sorry, uh, you know, and so I think that is important and something to consider as in the example that I gave. And I, I, I also want to make the pitch too that it's important uh, for me, uh, and I, I said the department has done a much, uh, really increased a lot of the effort we have. The farm groups have really, through Meg said, through the ag communicators, but I, I ask you too to help as well as legislators when you do your updates to make sure we're putting the uh, uh, pieces out there, especially this time of the year in January and February as we're uh, tough times and all the ag groups too as well, that we continue to uh, push those resources out there. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions at this point? All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Paul Anderson, Representative Anderson. Just thank you, minute, Madam please. Chair. Uh, thanks for the work you do uh, on the programs. They're, they're badly needed. Just a couple of quick questions. You mentioned uh, the radio outreach with the Red River Network, which reaches part of the state. What about the, the rest of the state, Linder Network, for example? Are we trying to expand that? Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, I think that's a great idea. We're starting with this as a pilot. I was fortunate to secure some federal funding. We'll see if that ever appears, but um, I was fortunate to secure some federal funding to make this happen. And I think our idea is to, to try this, work the bugs out, and then if we can find the resources to do that, to then expand it and do, it would be wonderful to cover the state. Um, and we're, we're intending to share this um, um, broadcast, but also make it available through websites, through Red River Farm Network, through our own, so it's available more broadly. And one thing I neglected to mention is, in addition to these short, um, uh, short radio pieces, they'll also be developing a little more in-depth podcast that goes with it, because we know that a lot of people like myself, when you're doing farm work, listen to podcasts, and that may be a way to go a little bit more in-depth. So I, I appreciate your pointing that out, and I think it's a terrific idea to see how we could cover more of the state. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Thanks again, Madam Chair. Uh, just to give an idea of the scope if we're reaching the people, getting the message out, any numbers as far as call volumes coming in on the, on the, uh, the hotline, things like that, uh, what kind of activity are we seeing? Ms. Moynihan. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, I do have some numbers. Um, since the beginning of this fiscal year, uh, starting in July, we have had 16 calls to the crisis line, people who, who have gone up to that. I mentioned we contract with First Call for, for Help ITASCA for mm -hmm. emotional counseling. And, um, and then we've our, our staff at the department have taken 17 calls about um, the farm um, business financial and legal questions and needing help with that. So that's what we have so far to date. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to come to the table and represent a brand.
A representative Poppy, would you like to move your bill? I would. I'd like to move House File 232. And um, this bill is a bill that um, some of you have signed on to. It is um, to take um, this current year and increase some funding in the two areas that um, we've heard about, the farm advocates and the rural mental health. And so I have a number of people here who are going to be able to speak to the issues, um, as we just heard. Um, certainly it's a, it's a situation that's dire and, and needs attention. So we're, we're wanting to address it as, as quickly as we can. I think one thing that I want to say is, um, you know, there's a there's a number of ways to try to address um, the the crisis right now, the the uh, mental health and emotional needs that we have going on, and that can be through outreach, advocacy, mediation, support, and that support can be emotional, financial, legal, and so today, next week, we're also going to be hearing from um, about FLAG, the legal action. Um, group and we're going to be hearing from farmer lender mediators and learning a little bit more about that and certainly you got a, um, a wealth of information today from Ms. Moynihan about what the department is doing already to um, to be able to address this and so I think we're we're trying to come up with a kind of a global solution um, so we're open to ideas and thoughts um, to make sure that we are doing things and that we start doing things as quickly as we can. So today, although we're laying over bills, we're, we're anticipating we're going to be addressing these issues in the very near future. So I'm just happy to be able to um, present the bills today. And I know Representative Keel has um, her bills that we'll be hearing about today as well. So I think um, it's, a, it's a sobering um, issue and um, we need to make sure that we're addressing it. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and so I'm going to ask, uh, we've got a number of people, but I'm going to start with uh, my good friend, Ted Matthews. Um, I've known Ted for a number of years. Um, I actually work as a, as a college counselor at Riverland Community College, and that was uh, my interaction with Ted began because I, I work with some farm business management instructors and um, was at a, a conference workshop that they held uh, that introduced me with Ted, um, to, and this was a number of years ago. So I've asked him to come. I know he's he is the person in the state of Minnesota that does rural mental health, and it's at no cost to our farmers and producers, farm families. Um, he's on the phone or on the road uh, continuously throughout um, every every day of the week. I know he's uh, talked about. So the, the Saturday and Sunday issues that uh, the commissioner was talking about, uh, Ted is available and, and meeting with people. So I'm just going to ask um, Ted to um, give a little bit of indication about what things are like right now and um, what the needs are. Thank you, Commissioner. Where is he? Yes. Um, the needs. One of the things that, that People Please really need to understand is farmers don't think like the rest of the world. And we try to get groups to help farmers when they think individually. They think about their individual farm, their individual families, their individual communities. And to get them to hear and look at outside sources, you have to go to them. You can't expect them to go to you. They just don't do it. So the best way that I know of is to get them to know you. And by doing that, going to groups where you talk to farmers and, and everything has changed so much in farming over the last 50 years, it doesn't even look like the same thing. If you, if you identified uh, farming 50 years ago to a group right now, it would be absolutely ridiculous. I mean, all of you, imagine going back in time, you know, 50 years, going into a restaurant where all males are sitting talking about farming, and you say, yeah, but we've got a lot of competition in Bolivia. They wouldn't know what you were talking about. Now, all of a sudden, we have competition all over the world, and farming as a base has changed totally. So women on the farm, you know, and I, I stress this all the time, women on the farm that's the biggest change in farming over the last 5,000 years. If forever a woman's role was to raise little farmers, 
and to do everything inside the house. Now they work off the farm and they do the books. And if you do the books, you have an opinion. And that opinion is going to be, why do we need to get a John Deere? Why do we need to get a new one? Why can't we get a used one? On and on and on about all those possibilities. And I think two heads are always better than one, but because that's a new concept, it's difficult. It's not like you can learn from your grandparents about how they did it, because they didn't do it that way. The, the situations were different. So everything in farming is changing and changing fast, and the stress on farms, there's always been a ton of stress on farms. And now there's stresses that we can't control. Like, right now there's too much milk. What do we do with that? What do we do? You know, and, and what do they do? Men and women, this may shock all of you, but men and women don't think alike and they don't talk alike. So when men and women are talking to each other, one of the big problems is if, if a man feels stressed in general, he's going to pull back. He's going to talk less. And a woman wants to talk it through. So you have two opposites. And what can happen on farms is because they're isolated, that male will pull back further and further and further. And eventually she'll give up because she's tried and tried and tried to have him talk. And he doesn't. And he keeps pulling back. And then the rate of suicide is definitely going up. And so how do we get them to communicate? And that brings in all a lot of the things that Meg was talking about, which is we have to work together to find ways to reach all those people. And that includes clergy and, and farm advocates and farm business management and extension and, and a lot of different people. And by us all pulling together for a common cause, I think we can help a lot of farmers that are still in a lot of stress. Thank you, Ted. You're Thank you. So as I mentioned, Ted is right now the solo person um, throughout the state providing um, this kind of um, uh, counseling and um, one of the aspects of the bill is to increase this year to be able to provide for um, hiring a, at least one additional person. Um, maybe there'd be more people eventually hired, but you know that we'd need to be looking at that. Um, the unique uh, relationship Ted has is that the money flows through the Department of Agriculture to um, the college, to the Minnesota State System, and then he's a contracted person to be able to provide services. So he does work seven days a week, some weeks, and he does um, take calls at any time of day and night. Um, so it's it's unique and, and we are so richly blessed in Minnesota to have Ted Matthews as our person. And he, and he has been, um, I mean, I know he was in conversation with Congressman Emmer about uh, the Stress Act and making sure that to try to replicate this in um, all of the states, the United States. So um, we we are fortunate, but of course it um, it's also due to the, the needs that we have here in the state. Representative Clever. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question would be about uh, numbers. If you could just help me understand, as I'm new to the committee, what are the what do the numbers look like as far as suicide rates for adults, suicide rates for teenagers, suicide rates, uh, and maybe even by gender, if you don't mind? And then also, what are the divorce rates like or domestic abuse rates? I can address some of those, but I definitely can't address numbers. Meg is the expert on numbers, so. Well, I could hold my question if you prefer. Yeah, I, that part. Um, but as far as domestic abuse, when stress, anxiety, and depression happen, domestic abuse goes up. Mm -hmm. And so I deal with that more now than I have in the past because that's a, that's a natural flow in, in any society. So that definitely goes up. Men um, try to commit suicide less often than women do, but men are a lot more successful. So the number of successful, and, and remember, all we know when we look at the paper is, are the people who are successful at right. killing themselves, not all the attempts. 
I deal with a ton of attempts that no one ever knows about, and people are really uncomfortable, and farmers especially are uncomfortable sharing that with, with the outside community because mm -hmm. they are judged. Right. So, which is which is another reason we're working or trying to work so hard with with clergy and and you know outside the social services and outside agencies to help them understand how farmers think and how farm families work, mm -hmm. so so they can help them and not be so judgmental because oftentimes uh, farmers can be very judgmental about other farmers. Representative Poston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Matthews, thank you for everything that you do. At a, at a recent uh, Malsey meeting, uh, and, and um, Chair Poppy um, just talked about hiring another person, but uh, at that meeting there was also a real concern about your retirement. And so I'm, I'm asking you about your retirement, but I'm asking you if you're mentoring somebody to take your place when that time comes? Well, I'm only 26. <laughs> answer, thank you for your answer. Um, hopefully we will get, we'll, we will get some help. Um, and, you know, part of that help is, is not just with, with therapists, but, but with farm advocates and um, they do a ton of work and, and I work with them and when, when it's, too hard for them to deal with the situation, they call me and then I deal with that. So um, increasing the numbers there with, with the farm advocates and... Um, and farmer lender yeah. mediation people. Uh, when, when we have those things, then it, it just becomes a whole lot easier. And you know, as Meg and I talk about all the time, when people um, don't know what to do, they do nothing. And so what we're pushing all the time is to get people to know somebody to call, who cares who, just somebody to call when they're concerned about the mental health of anyone. And the fact is, you know, if, if we're concerned that, that someone may commit suicide and we're wrong, then we get a little embarrassed. But if we're right, and so, you know, you have to weigh that and, and truly understand that being a little embarrassed beats the heck out of not saying something and then finding out somebody committed suicide and you're saying, yeah, I kind of thought that he or she might have done that. Um, so we're trying to get that kind of word out and that's a lot of us doing that, not just me, but a lot of us trying to get that word out and, and work with those things. And as far as retirement goes, 10 years ago I was going to retire and then eight years ago and then six years ago. Um, I, I will stay on for at least another two years if, if I'm allotted that uh, position. And um, that will hopefully be to train as many people as I can plus um, do the things I do. Uh, remember, I, I do a ton of speaking engagements, but, but my passion is working with farmers, working with the families and doing those things. I do the speaking engagements so people know who I am and can see me because I practice what I preach. If they know me, if they see me, if they've heard me, it's easy for them to call me. But if they just hear the name, they, they don't. So it's a comfort level thing and, and, and that's one of the things that we push really hard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Oh. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Matthews, God bless you. and. Uh, amazing work you do. My opinion, but I would think it'd be safe to say that a lot of the situations you face are financial in nature, you know, the financial stress of, of farming. And at the state level, you know, not a lot of funding issues we deal with. That's more on the federal side. So in a general sense, could you kind of walk us through how you, how you would deal with, 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 with a guy, a farmer, in, in financial stress, and how do you kind of walk them back from the edge? Okay, focusing on the concept of stress, stress and not finance, because I am a moron when it comes to those things. But when it comes to the financial stress, what I do is I have them focus on what they can do rather than all the things that they can't do. We bog ourselves down with, you know, this can't happen, I can't get this, I can't do this, I can't do And by the time you get done with all of that emotional turmoil, you have no energy left to look at the things you can do. 
So what I have them do is focus on what can I do? How can I go forward? What are the things that will make this a little better? There is no fix. If, if I owe a lot of money, I can't just say, oh, if I do this, then I won't owe it anymore. But I can feel better because I've gone in a direction that will make me feel better that I've done something positive as opposed to constantly just looking at all the negative things that go on. Could we have Ms. Moynihan come up just to answer uh, Representative Cleborn's uh, question about the statistics and, and gender, please? Would you like me to sit on your lap, Mr. Mayor? Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. Chair and Representative, um, I'm very gratified to hear that question from you. And the, the short answer is we really don't know. Um, that's the impetus beyond, behind that partnership that we're doing with the Department of Health right now. Um, uh, uh, from what I understand, talking to the epidemiologists, the medical examiners are responsible for coding the deaths. Mm -hmm. And those are coded by occupation uh, and by industry. And sometimes somebody who farms but also does other work may be coded under the other work. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a, um, a, a farm wife or a farm woman, in my case, uh, who works on the farm uh, might be classified as a homemaker or a Department of Agriculture person rather than also as a mm -hmm. farmer. So it's really difficult to know. Um, in fact, it's difficult at the national level. The commissioner and I were just talking about the fact that the Centers for Disease Control retracted a study a couple of months ago, um, some data that had classified farming as one of the highest suicide categories, and they found inconsistencies in their data. So they've, they've retracted that study. We know that it is a, a, a dangerous occupation um, for, for death but also for farm accidents mm -hmm. and we also know stresses contribute to those we know that stress contributes to um, to illness to health and illness and we know that stress contributes to poor decision making so we're seeing all of these connected but to your specific point about suicide I hope very much by the end of um, June that we will have some better information about how it's affecting our farmers in Minnesota thank you thank you thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Matthews then I think um, I appreciate that um, Ted is here to be able to answer questions and we'll be here um, throughout the rest of the hearing as well. Um, but we have a few more people to, to bring up to talk about um, the bill and um, farm advocates and the, and the resources. So. Yeah, um, if I can uh, call up uh, Matt McDevitt uh, from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Farm Advocates Program, please. Thank you, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Is he here? I, okay. I think okay. we're good on that one then because okay. and and everybody does have a brochure so you do know where the farm advocates are I, um, previously when we've had a hearing along these lines Connie Dykes has been here to be able to and I know that she's ill today and wasn't able to come um, as well so so I think we can move on then okay uh, AJ Dewar from the Minnesota Association for Agriculture Educators And then, Mr. Dewar, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. And your guest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, AJ Dewar, and I represent, I'm wearing two hats today, uh, representing the Minnesota Association of Agriculture Educators and also the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association. Uh, I'm going to talk just very briefly uh, in. The, our association of the egg educators, the farm business management instructors are included. Uh, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the FBM program and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Gilly to speak uh, on behalf of the soybean growers and to uh, tell her story and to share her thoughts. Uh, uh, for those unfamiliar with uh, FBM, uh, farm business management, it's a, it's a program run through Minnesota State. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, there, are, there are instructors at, at, at each of Minnesota State campuses, and, and farmers can buy credits uh, just like any other student would buy credits. But it's not a typical class where you don't go to campus and, and sit in a classroom. Uh, what happens is the instructor will visit, periodically visit your farm and go over your finances with you. And uh, I've had the privilege to do a couple of ride-alongs with a couple of FBM instructors. And uh, the first thing that, that hit me was uh, just the complexity of of the business model of a farmer has. Uh, 
even when the farm economy is good, I would feel stressed just by how complex uh, these farmers have to, all the things they have to think about uh, when they're going through their books and they're, when, they're, when they're running their businesses. Uh, and of course, when the, when the farm economy is down, which it has been the last few years, um, you, you add that stress to it. And uh, I probably did a, about a half a dozen visits with some FBM instructors, and I, and I can say there was, there was palpable stress at every single stop. And, and one even ended in tears where they're just wondering if they could keep doing it. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, if we want any more details on the FBM program, there'll probably be future hearings on that. I'd be happy to come back. But uh, for now, I want to turn it over to Ms. Gilly. Ms. Gilly, please state your name. And Hello, I'm Teresa Gilly. I'm a farmer from Kitson County. Uh, I am a past president of the Minnesota Soybean Growers. And uh, thank you for letting me come and uh, talk with you today. I got asked by Representative Keel to come last week. Um, this is going to be a little tough, but uh, as I said, I farm in Kitson County. I was in partnership with my husband till April 1st of 2017, and on that day, my husband killed himself. So, uh, in the midst of all that, you know, it's been interesting to listen to some other people talk. Um, we were having farm financial trouble. Um, in uh, 2015, we had, a, we had a pretty bad, we had some pretty good years, but then, you know, we, were, you know, we dipped into our working capital because we had landlords that wanted to sell and things like that. Um, farming is unique um, because um, the banker doesn't let you loan on 100% of the value of your land. They only let you, let you get a loan on 65% of your land. So what do farmers do when these things happen? Thank you very much. <laughs> is um, you, you dip into your working capital. And my husband and I did that because we had a couple of landlords that wanted to sell, and it was our opportunity. This was land we, we rented for over 20 years. Um, uh, so in the winter of 16, we knew, I knew in the fall of 16 that um, I'm in the field, and I knew that we didn't have enough crop. The pr crop prices went down. And... Um, I was looking for alternatives. I spent all winter looking for alternatives. I always, kind of, I do kind of, people go, well, well, why don't you reach out? And I tell people, um, I started in November working with banks. So, uh, and I also tell people, we're very aware of what's going on on our farms. And, uh, but um, through, the, through the winter, I tried different banks. I went to the banks I was dealing with. My bankers were I would say better with me alone than they were when my husband came in. So I've had a little chat with some bankers because sometimes they need to uh, be a little careful with what they say. I am on a farm that was established back in 1899 and I'm the only one running it right now. Actually, I, that's kind of a lie. I'm, I have two neighbors that I'm farming with, and they, and they have taken me in, and, which is really great. My farm is not nearly the, as big as it, is, as it used to be. Um, I only farm about 950 acres right now, <coughs> which some of you probably think is big, but <laughs> in Kitson County, it really isn't. Um, but uh, so on that day, uh, I found my husband. Uh, it was a one shot, and, and, and I found him on my phone on a gravel road. So my life is different. But I will, I will say that I have heard from people that are dealing with farm stress in their families, and I take every call I can. And part of it is I just want them to, if they can help with one or two things, it brings them back to steady. Um, I, the other factor, because I, I spoke to a Nurses in Action, back in October, and I was with Keith Orlander from Eggcentric. And, um, and in the middle of my talk, I was telling them about uh, what had happened to me and how some people have reached out to me, some people that have had suicides in their families and stuff like that. The one thing I will tell you is I have not heard of a single farm wife that has killed herself. I have only heard of farm husbands, which leads me to a new dynamic. And that dynamic is that, um, unlike me, I was very involved with my farm. So I did all the finances. I did, I did all that. I was very aware. Um, a lot of farm wives, I would say the majority of farm wives, are listed as farmers at FSA and stuff. So I, I would guess that because it has to do with how the programs work. Um, 
so it's amazing how many people I've heard from, um, they're not very aware of what's really going on on their whole farms because they work part-time jobs and they have jobs in town, um, which wasn't me. Um, well, actually, that's not true either because I got elected county commissioner but <laughs> in, in November of 16. But um, having uh, the farmer hotline is, a, is an excellent thing. One person is not a good thing. We need more than that. Um, I think we do need to talk with the bankers and anybody that deals with them in these hard financial stress times to help them figure out an avenue. Um, most of these farms, it's amazing how many farms are over 100 years old. And it's a pride thing. I will tell you right now, my husband never worked off the farm. He never punched a clock, ever. Unlike me, I've done all other things. It wasn't his, but he was a farmer. He was a farmer since he was three years old when he was out in the tractor with his, with his grandfather. So, you know, the mentality, it, it isn't, you know, how many people wake up and say at, when they're three, year, three years old that they want to be an accountant? That doesn't happen. But little farmers do. They have little tractors when they're little people and they're farming on, a, on the carpet in the living room. That's what little farmers do. And they grow up to be bigger farmers, and they're, and they're out. Bryce was mowing. He was a little kid. Probably wasn't. Probably shouldn't have had him out on the lawnmower. When he was in, in elementary school, he was running the grain cart. You know, they're pretty knowledgeable. They're also very diverse. Farmers are a lot smarter than they give themselves credit for. My husband had a CDL license. He was a commercial spray, spray applicator. And he could not figure out what else to do. And it's just, um, but his mentality got really narrow. And, um, but uh, I don't know, AJ, is there anything else you want me to talk about? I will take any questions anybody has. Um, I will continue to answer any questions that people reach out to me for. Um, as I said, Representative Keel asked me to come, and I feel it is my responsibility to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else because it's, it's been almost a year and 10 months for me, and it's still a struggle every day. But every day, I've gotten up to get something accomplished. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Representative Cleveland. I'll take any questions if anybody has any. I would just like to say thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story. It's a painful story. I'm so sorry for your loss, but it is so critical that we hear these stories and that the entire state hear these stories so that the need is addressed and that the prevention does occur. So I just want to say thank you. I do really think, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to get out and tell people, this is what happens after it happens. And, uh, and, it's, and if they think they're doing a favor for their family, it's devastating for these families. I was on the phone with a young gal from North Dakota. Her husband killed himself on October 25th. They had three children. The oldest one was five. The youngest one had its first birthday on November 1st. Mm -hmm. and, I, and they were struggling. And I'll tell you that I would guess 95% of it is financial <coughs> from everybody that I've talked to. So they're having financial problems. I want them to understand resilience. And resilience is to teach them how to get up. Because when they get narrow, and they get narrow-minded, and mine, my husband did. He, was very, he got very narrow-minded, and I didn't see what was right in front of my face. And uh, now 50, 50, now when I, 2020 vision is, you know, you, when you look back. But um, I do tell people to look out for some early things when they're not sleeping, when they're irritable. You know, eating habits are different. Um, you know, if they get a little shaky, um, I heard of some, actually I visited with a farmer yesterday, and they had a neighbor that is um, in dairy, and um, they said that he was staying out really late working on stuff in the barn and stuff, and he ended up in an accident, and they're not real sure if 
it was an accident on purpose. And, uh, but I, I will tell you that I have not heard of a single farm wife that has killed herself. They've all been farm husbands. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, <laughs> Ms. Gilly. Thank you, for Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to call Jennifer Andrashko. And please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. <clears throat> Madam Chair Poppy, Vice Chair Brand, and my representative and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Jennifer Andrashko. I'm a professor of social work at Minnesota State University, Mankato, and a licensed independent clinical social worker with the state of Minnesota. I'm sorry, licensed by the state of Minnesota. I don't work for the state of Minnesota. Let me clarify that. Um, before I joined the social work faculty in 2014, I worked for a number of years in rural Minnesota, in south central Minnesota, as the director and a behavioral health provider in uh, a small community behavioral health center. We served 27 counties, that was a tall order, and we served a number of farming communities. My experience in this role left me forever changed, um, witnessing some of the things that you've been hearing about today, and then also, more systemically, the gaps in the services in the mental health workforce, um, and feeling what that feels like, along with people who feel that in a very real way in their personal lives. So um, with that experience, I have understood a certain responsibility and urgency to have conversations about these issues. And it's with that urgency and responsibility that I'm here today. So I want to begin with a quick story about um, something that I carry with me that I learned at a conference many years ago. Um, and I'll just start. Um, it was a large conference. There were hundreds of us, five, six hundred people maybe in the room. And the keynote took the stage. She was a professor of nursing who had worked for many, many years in memory loss. She took the stage, and there were three huge screens behind her on the wall. And she, the first thing she did was put up an image right above her head. And it was the image of a scan of a brain. And she explained this is a brain scan, an image of a brain scan of a normal, healthy adult. And she put up a huge image on the huge screen to her left. And it was another scan of a brain. And she said, this is an image of a brain scan. Um, and you'll notice that it's very different than the first one. And indeed it was. There was. It was clear that there was gray matter missing and sort of it was clumped differently in different parts of the brain. And she said this is the brain of an adult of the same age with Alzheimer's. And then she put up a, a third and final image on the other screen and said, what do you notice about this brain? And, and the commentary in the audience was it looks almost exactly like the brain of someone with Alzheimer's. And in fact, it was the brain of an adult of the same age with schizophrenia. And she posed this question to the audience, which I'll never forget. She said, can you imagine a world in which we treat human beings who have brains that look like this with the same care and concern and support with policies and systems as we treat someone with a brain that looks like this with Alzheimer's? Um, and so I, I believe that we can, and I believe that's why we're all here today, because we care about, about these issues and about um, eradicating stigma. So I think we have to make a choice. Um, either we begin to address the very real unmet mental health needs in rural parts of our country and in our state, or we continue to live with the consequences. The impact that these unmet needs have on individuals themselves, the families they're trying to raise, uh, the places they work, the communities they live, and our state as a whole are felt in many ways. The human toll is burned into my mind. Um, I don't see data points plotted on a graph, I hear people's voices, I hear people's stories. I think about um, clients I've worked with who have taken their lives or have suffered incredible, incredibly hard things. The economic toll is just as powerful. It was no secret in the community where I was working in community mental health that the work we were doing was saving the local hospital and I guess taxpayers as a whole an incredible sum of money simply by working to address mental health needs before they were exacerbated and before they were acute and debilitating. The mental health workforce crisis, in other words, not having the, the physical bodies in our rural communities to do the work, um, has created a situation where our police officers, our emergency rooms, and our jails are our de facto mental health system. 
and it, it's not working. Expanding access to counseling services to Minnesota farmers and farming communities will be a challenge if we cannot also simultaneously address the workforce issues that we know to be pervasive in all of rural America and definitely in rural Minnesota. My ask here today is that the committee would take some concrete steps to work to build that workforce in our own state. And I'll end my testimony now with some clear steps and a little bit of data about what we know about how to do that. Nine of Minnesota's 11 geographic re regions have been designated by HRSA, by the federal government, as health provider shortage areas. Um, if there's anything good about having health provider shortage areas, it is that it means um, providers in those areas have access to loan forgiveness. And the, the state of Minnesota does some of that, and the federal government does some of that in shortage areas. The bad news is that we now know that while these programs aid in recruitment, they don't actually, that, that doesn't translate into retention. And that's a problem, as it's one of the goals of, of those loan forgiveness programs. Um, the good news is we know some things about people who do tend to graduate in a, from a graduate program or a medical school in psychiatry and move and live and stay and work in mental health workforces in rural Minnesota. So um, we categorize them into kind of three groups. People who, who tend to live and work and stay in rural communities in, mental, in the mental health workforce are people who grew up in a rural community, um, people who studied, I think this one is interesting as someone who works in higher education, but people who studied in a graduate program where there was explicit content describing rural practice. If you work in a rural setting, you know it's, it's a very different practice, right? Anonymity is dead, it just doesn't exist. And if you come from a metropolitan area, that can be a stretch. You have to sort of, I did it. <laughs> I was surprised. Um, stigma is very real and felt very differently. Conversations that we have about mental health are very different because everybody knows your business, right? So it's a different way of practicing. And so something about having content in your graduate program that describes what rural practice is um, was a factor in keeping people in rural communities. And then finally, students who had a field placement or a psychiatric residency in a rural setting tended to want to stay. And that made a lot of sense to me. If you come from an urban center to practice in a rural setting, and let's say that you're a psychiatrist, and, and you graduate from the University of Minnesota residency program in psychiatry, and you move to greater Minnesota, you will find it's a very different practice. But if you've studied even as a resident, before you finish your, your program in a rural setting, you've done so alongside a preceptor, alongside someone who has come before you, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Someone who can help you along in the process and understanding how this work is different and how you can do it. Um, on the mental health provider side, um, in social work and marriage and family therapy and licensed professional counselors and counselors in schools and, and universities, the same is true. You have a supervisor who works and operates in that community who knows how to kind of show you the ropes. So the unintended consequences of inaction are serious and preventable, and you heard some examples about that already. Suicide is a clear and often preventable consequence. In rural parts of Minnesota, suicide rates, completion rates, are much, much higher than they are in our urban centers. And we know that to be true because we have greater access to lethal means and because there is decreased access to mental health services. Those two things collide, and that's where we see those numbers. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would end by saying what can be done. I would propose just a couple things. One, the committee might consider a scholarship in each of those nine regions, a scholarship for students, so almost like targeted recruitment to high school and college students who have an interest in, in working and staying in the mental health workforce in those regions. Two, thinking about curricula in high school textbooks. We currently don't have any content in high school textbooks about behavioral health, full stop. And then three, there is not currently a psychiatric residency in this state in rural greater Minnesota. And that might be something that we consider too. Um, we have an opportunity to be on the right side of history and to create novel, creative responses to this crisis. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I answer any questions that you have. Thank you. I think we'll have, uh, we want to be respectful of time. So we've got two more people that need to, um, would like to come up and then, um, because I, I want to give plenty of time to Representative Keel because she has her bills to present as well. Um, and I think, you know, uh, what uh, Ms. Andrasco has indicated is, you know, this is a, 
a big issue. And um, we in uh, the Ag Committee certainly are trying to address something that also does uh, kind of flow into health care and education. And I think, um, you know, Representative Keel will be able to address that somewhat too when she's presenting her bills. But it's, you know, we, we have a need. Um, and there are maybe many ways for us to try to consider to, to address it. So thank you. Representative Miller does have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Madam Chair, I'll be very brief in consideration of time, mm -hmm. but I thought this was the appropriate time for me to bring this up. And I'm going to skip through my notes to keep it brief, so hopefully this will be quick and coherent. I really do appreciate everything that you're doing here. I think that the need is there, is present, it's very obvious in this room. I see this broken down in two issues. We sort of have the business related business help, and then we need the help with people's mental states. And what I'm hoping as this bill moves forward is um, I think, I think uh, uh, Ms. Andraska, <coughs> and if I said that wrong, I apologize. I think she touched on the one thing that maybe at this time in the bill is not particularly being addressed enough. And while I think Mr. Matthews is doing a great job, and I think that uh, farm business management, some of these programs with the colleges and stuff are doing a good job with, okay, how do we work through the problems of this business? How do we solve the problem? I had a failed business myself years ago, and I know how hard that is. Because like you said, Mr. Matthews, you see all these things you can't do. You don't pay attention to things you can do. But when we talk about the mental health of the individual, the effects on marriage, substance abuse, suicide, the effects on children and stuff like that, uh, these programs and the money that I at least see going isn't really addressing that, those issues. And, and I certainly hope that we can find ways. One of the concerns I had that Mrs. Or, sorry, Ms. Andreshko said, we're not, we don't have enough mental health providers in rural Minnesota. One of the big reasons why we don't is the, um, is the reimbursement rate right. is bad and going down from there, okay? Uh, the interest of going to rural Minnesota, all these challenges. So we can address some of the business things. We're set up for that in agriculture a little bit better, but this, the mental health of someone that is going through incredible stress we need to find ways to build those avenues better. So as you move this bill forward, I hope we can kind of identify those because I, I want to be fair and say great bill, but I don't think that this addresses that enough. I think that's probably a fair statement. I mean, we, that's why I said it's, we have a, a large issue here that we're going to have to, you know, try to take different angles and figure out how we can help, help people. Mr. Miller, uh, please state your name and begin your testimony. Yes. Vice Chair Brand, uh, members of the committee, Chair Bobby. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Bruce Miller, and I'm here today on behalf of Minnesota Farmers Union. Uh, a couple of things. First, I just think I, I want to thank uh, strongly Commissioner Peterson and Meg Monahan from the Department of Agriculture who have laid out uh, and who have created a program that doesn't exist hardly anywhere else in the country. And I, I think we should be as a state proud of that because of the work that we're doing. Uh, to Ted Matthews. <laughs> I can't believe that you cover more parts of the state than I do, but you are on the road constantly, seven days a week, helping people out. And, and I want to thank um, also um, Ms. Gilly uh, for putting a, a face on uh, a tragic situation that we're all too aware of. Finally, I want to thank Representative Chair Poppy and Representative Keel, just for helping elevate this issue so early in the legislative session. Uh, th this is something that needs quick attention. I am specifically here at the request of Minnesota Farmers Union President Gary Wordish, who asks me to express our strong support for this kind of work in making funding available and expanding this program. And I do say expanding this program. One, Mr. Matthews, is not enough for a whole state. I'm not sure 10, Mr. Matthews, is enough for a whole state. As you all know, from, from if you represent a rural district or if you represent an urban or suburban district, Minnesota agriculture is in difficult times. Um, we uh, are seeing record low prices. We are seeing, in some cases, a report came out yesterday that indicates that Minnesota may have been harder hit agriculturally than other states. Um, and I think just the knowledge that low prices, high input costs, the financial stress of the banks getting tighter, um, stress is ever present in the lives of every farmer 
every every spouse of every farmer and every child of every farmer and the communities they live in. But yet, it's one of those things that we don't talk about too much in rural Minnesota. We don't talk much about it in urban Minnesota. I can I can assure you that if you go to the about this time of day, if you go to the uh, Bruton Bakery in Bruton, Minnesota, where a group of farmers is uh, gathered, or any small town and or any small cafe in your town, where a group of fa farmers are gathered, I can bet you with some certainty that they are not sitting around talking about stress, suicide, depression, and anxiety. Are they feeling that? The heck, yes, they are. And they and I can tell you that. Every farmer in that cafe knows of another farmer, not in that cafe, who may be in danger of the kinds of things we're talking about and who doesn't know where to turn. Mr. Matthews and Ms. Gilly both kind of touched on something, is that this is not something you talk about. Farmers don't talk. They don't talk as a group. And so when we talk about farmers, we really need to be very careful to say we're talking about that individual that comprises that class of farmers. So every farm, every farmer, every spouse, every child is different. And we need to make sure that the programs we identify here, the ones through the Department of Ag, the, the farm stress program, the farm advocates program, our support of legal aid, a legal action group, um, and maybe more. Maybe there are more ideas that we can still bring to the table. But for now, we strongly support, and we're happy to see other agricultural groups join us in this, I'm happy to support the kind of legislation you're looking at, and we particularly look forward to working with you and crafting what that might finally end up. And hopefully, it's our hope, that, we'll, that you can come out of committee soon and that we can go to the floor soon and that we can get action out of the Senate soon and that we can put some more people in the field. We don't need just more money for the future. We need more money for now. We need to really be serious about how we expand these programs because I can assure you that it's not our belief that this stress is going to go away in the next few years. It is with us for a long time and we need to take all of these programs and weave them into a safety blanket. So I think that's our job as advocates. That's your job as legislators. And let me finish with one thing. I had a member tell me the other day that when they go to break, that they're going to be doing their town meetings. So I would encourage you when you do your town meetings, I'm pretty sure that these are readily available. I would take them and I'd put them on the table. Our experience, when we go to our, to our, to our uh, input meetings, when we go to sessions like we're in Mankato, we put these on the table, you know what? They, they get picked up. And they get picked up especially if you're not watching. <laughs> so if you put these on the back table at your town meeting, you've just done a favor to a large number of people. And, and with that, Chair Poppy, on behalf of Minnesota Farmers Union, we urge uh, your continuous action on this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, last, we'll call um, Amber Hansen Glazer from the Minnesota Farmers Union, or Farmers Farm Bureau. And I'll just ask Amber to, you know, be as quick as she can, because again, we have um, two other bills to hear, Representative Keel. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Madam Chair, uh, my name is Amber Hansen Glazer. I'm the Director of Public Policy for Minnesota Farm Bureau. Thank you for addressing this tough issue, and thank you for addressing it so early in session. Uh, Minnesota is a leader, like you've heard, in the work we're doing on mental health facing our rural communities, but there's so much more we can be doing. Minnesota Farm Bureau is strongly advocating for access to tools, resources, and support systems for these issues. Um, like you've heard already today, especially highlighted by Ted and Jennifer, mental health in agriculture and rural Minnesota is so unique. And we need to continue to find those tools in whatever forms those look like in ways that work in rural Minnesota. Um, resources that address that unique culture that are affordable. We talked a lot about that this is coming from times of financial stress. And oftentimes those traditional means of mental health um, therapy, those other avenues are considered a luxury when that extra cash and spending isn't there. So that's something that's greatly appreciated through these programs. And finally, somebody that talks that language, that farmer language. Uh, Minnesota Farm Bureau is greatly appreciative of the work that Ted and others in the Department of Agriculture do. And we know that there's more we can do. So thank you, Chair Poppy, for bringing this up. We look forward to um, continuing to address this issue and finding whatever that end solution looks like. Um, but we strongly support this and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. 
Is there anybody else in the room that would like to testify on this bill? Uh, members, are there any questions? Okay. So no further questions. Representative Poppy, do you have any closing statements? Um, I just appreciate the opportunity to, for everyone to be able to be heard and certainly for Teresa to come and share her personal story because it's, um, it's a devastating um, and life-changing experience that you went through and it's um, certainly hit us all today to hear that, to know what the outcome can be. And um, we want to be able to resolve that for you and for future families. Um, so I just appreciate that. And um, I just would like to move House File 232 to be laid over for future consideration. Representative Anderson, you had a quick question? Yeah, very quick, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the chair, chairwoman process uh, that's going to be held over. You know, we think of that as being held over till late in the session, omnibus bill. Oh. What's going to happen with this? Um, I thank you for the question, actually. Um, there, I think what we're going to do, I want to be able to hear Representative Keel's bills. One of her bills will also be held over for future consideration. That's our um, terminology we're using so that we can just lay it over and then be able to bring those up. And there may be some additional amendments or things that we're going to do, and maybe we will have a, um, a, a, a bill that we will talk about with farm advocates, with rural mental health, with um, farmer lender mediation to increase that. Maybe there's some additional resources that need to be done through the outreach and marketing. You know, we heard about uh, what the department is doing with um, the radio. So there may be some things, but I, I don't want it to lay over for months at a, at a time here. We need to address this. But I want to make sure that we're going to address it in a way that's actually going to work um, so that we, if we're putting money into it, let's figure out um, what the best solution is and how we're going to do that. So I think we'll, we'll certainly want to have something early here now, and then we'll, we'll be addressing it um, for the future with the Ag Finance Bill in the future, too. Representative Miller, real quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and this will be quick. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, just... Uh, if you could give us when this is coming back, if you sure. could give us a little more heads up, <laughs> not not than this, but I mean like then three days before, because I have someone that is in the mental health profession that will want to testify on this, and I'd want to be able to give them some time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, certainly. And, and I know that Teresa, Ms. Gilly came uh, really for Representative Keel. So, um, you know, uh, you know, we this is a nonpartisan issue. This is a bipartisan, mm -hmm. fully supported. Um, we have worked on this issue for a number of years together. Representative Hamilton and I have addressed this over the course of years and uh, Representative Anderson as well. So I think it's something we want to make sure that we're um, that we're moving forward as a as a community here in agriculture. Members with that, uh, the bill is laid over. Uh, next on the agenda is House File 82, Representative Keel. All right, Representative Keel, and you do have two bills, House File 82 and House File 84. So I think yeah. um, what we'll want to do probably is address um, House File 82. Um, I think is that the one that's... Um, 20, that's 20. the outgoing one, right? right? And 84 is the one that's to address this. Today. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. 2019. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before we do that, uh, could I, um, I members, um, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, really want to point out how important this is. If you don't already know, I'm a farmer also. And actually, um, uh, Teresa Gilley and I got to know each other uh, long before either one of us were in politics, uh, we went to an Annie's project because we we're both farm wives that work on the farm. And I was a farm daughter also, but with four brothers, you don't do as much farm work as you do when you're the spouse. And um, I would like to point out the other subject in this that, uh, and Ted Matthews and I kind of briefly talked about it. Something we don't talk about when we have financial stress is the generational changes that are happening on our farm. And I want to remind people that our average age of farmers is well into their late 50s. And so we're seeing a huge change in agriculture. Are our, our, our young people, both sons and daughters, staying home on the farm and the challenges that happen as our farmers even live 
um, longer in their lifestyle. So can they farm with their sons and daughters longer or do they leave and that uh, is another emotional stress that happens. Um, I'm blessed to have both Teresa come today and uh, Shauna Wrightmeyer. Shauna is a uh, Northwest Mental Health Center director, but as someone pointed out how close things are, Shauna lives, uh, grew up and across the section in the winter I could see her house and she babysat my children. So um, it, we come full circle and, um, and work together on, on uh, this important issue. It's very big in my district um, and there are some real challenges with what we're dealing with. Um, the, and we've already talked about quite a bit of them, but I would like to introduce to you uh, Shauna Reitmeyer and, and have her explain what, what they are trying to do in the mental health center. Thank you. And before we do that, let's just put yeah. one of these bills oh. before us. So if we just okay. move house file, do you want to move house file 82? Yes, I will. Uh, this point. Madam Chair, I would like to move house file for uh, 82 for possible inclusion in the omnibus finance bill. Thank you. And welcome to the committee. Thank you for coming down and uh, being here for this. And uh, we want to give you some time to be able to present your information. So please share your name and then go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Shauna Reitmeyer. And um, as uh, Representative Keel mentioned, I serve as the Chief Executive Officer for the Northwestern Mental Health Center. Um, we are a certified community behavioral health clinic that serves six rural frontier agriculture communities, including um, Teresa Gillies uh, area in Northwest Minnesota. And um, not only do I come with a passion for mental health, I was also born and raised on our family farm, um, three generations farming. We are not farming anymore, um, but we still have very close ties. So this is near and dear to my heart and know firsthand the stressors that um, face our farming and agriculture families and, and individuals. Um, so what I'm going to say uh, this morning is probably going to be a little disjointed because I'm going to try to not repeat everything that many other people have already said this morning. Um, but one of the things that I am uh, really pleased to hear was the when Meg Moynihan was talking about the, the reach across different departments within the state of Minnesota. This is a new committee for me to be sitting at. Um, I'm normally at the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, and so it is just exciting to know that mental health is coming up in this arena as well. Um, I think at times that, you know, in, in the mental health industry, a lot of times we talk about cultural competence and how do we meet the needs of providing services culturally and respectfully. And many times we think about race and, race and ethnicity, but we don't think about industries. And in the ag world, Agriculture may to some people be seen as an industry, but to people that live it, it's a way of life. And right now, um, having that cultural competency of working with our agriculture families and individuals, you need to come and bring with it a set of skills and knowledge and understanding of what is happening because the stressors that our farming families are experiencing are surmounted beyond what others may be experiencing. And so I use the analogy in our region many times that Northwestern Mental Health Center serves a geographic size about the state of Vermont. My organization has a total of about 150 employees, 120 that have clinical expertise that serve a very rural area. Yes, some of us like myself have an ag background and are able to outreach, but if I have 120 for the entire population, the state of Minnesota has Ted Matthews for the entire state with that cultural competency. So when you put that into perspective, we really need to have additional resources. Now, where I am excited is that someone like Ted is able to intersect with an organization like mine. We operate a 24 seven mobile crisis team. Many community mental health centers across the state of Minnesota have that as a resource. So when Ted gets a call from somebody and he's getting it way up in my neck of the woods, but he's way 
way down in the south part of the state, at least there's some resources that can be able to help and respond. Or when there is more targeted outreach or, or services that are needed that he's not able to provide because of geography, we can link and partner together with some of those skills and expertise that community mental health centers provide. But we do need to have somebody, more people with competencies. I, um, I, I'm having this opportunity right now to um, participate in doing a six-part webinar series. So when Teresa Gilley talks about how do we build resiliency, this six-part webinar series is targeted towards women in farming because many women are the ones that are helping support, if they're not the the sole farmer, they're supporting and underlying this foundation for our farming families. And it's building resiliency and mental health skills, self-care and, and ability to work and, and survive in this um, industry that they're in, in this way of life. Um, because we know that based on statistics, one in five people at any given time in their life will experience a diagnosable mental health issue. That doesn't, that, that covers our ag way of life. It's not meant to be anybody. And so our, it, it can be anybody. It's not just one sector of people. We are not immune um, to experiencing these issues. And so I am really excited and thank you Representative Keel for bringing this forward. Representative Poppy for carrying your bill. You know, however, we're able to bring additional resources to the state of Minnesota for people that have the competencies and the skill set specifically to meet the needs, mental health needs for, the, for our farming and ag communities and intersect with other areas that have additional resources. Um, I support that and, and hope to see these bills move forward. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I don't see any questions here. Um, Representative Keel, on this particular bill, do you want to uh, um, um, have any final comments for this? House file 82. No, um, just I, we've already had a lot of conversation about it, so we move that uh, House file 82 so that it's laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus finance bill, right? Correct? That's correct. This is the outgoing one, so this is the one for the future budget years. So, mm -hmm. yes. And then House file 84. Um, but, yes. Would you like to describe that bill? I would like to move, or do you want me to move yes, it first? You move um, I would like to move um, House File 84 um, before the committee, and uh, I guess that would be also uh, laid over for future consideration. However, um, we've had some conversation, um, members, and I would urge uh, uh, Chair Poppy and um, just so that we can maybe get it through the Senate and to the governor's desk as soon as possible, I think. Uh, as we have discussed here, the crisis is now. Um, this is in agriculture. We've already, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of this, we've already purchased and planned for the next crop. So there might be a farmer still working on their bills, but they've already purchased seed and are finding out that, oh, maybe this isn't going to work so well. And um, there are some real challenges that come up at this time of year. This is when you spend a little more time with those farm business management advisors and you're really digging down into the numbers and analyzing what it is you uh, need to do in your farm. Um, and there's all kinds of conversations. I'm a, I'm a crop farmer, but you talk about animals that is constantly changing. And um, uh, we really need to be able to uh, fund this and do this as soon as possible. I would agree. So I'm. I'm. Um, I, I thank you for presenting the bill. And yes, to move this one for future consideration, we'll have a couple of options. We will hear next week from um, the bill that uh, Representative Brand has regarding flag. Um, we'll hear about farmer lender mediation. As I said, there may be additional concepts and bills that we might want to uh, pull together as well. But I think um, certainly today. We've heard about the need and the concern and the, the immediacy that we need to take, um, take for this. So I, I appreciate that. I think we'll have 
um, if we have Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you to you and also to Representative Keel for bringing forth this very important uh, issue, of course. And, and Madam Chair, um, I would encourage you also to, uh, to be moving these bills out. Um, last year was a prime example on what will happen if we collectively don't stand together and not allow uh, bills to be rolled into omnibus bills. Uh, because as you recall, we passed these last year and it would have addressed these very important issues. And, and I think back to uh, former representative and now uh, Chief Justice, Paul Thiessen, uh, that was making uh, very uh, profound uh, comments as it relates to omnibus bills as well in one of his last days. And it's uh, going to be up to all of us to, uh, to tell our leadership this is very important. Uh, let's learn from uh, things that happened in the past, and let's move bills like this on their own. So thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership, and also thank you, Representative Keel, for yours. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have House File 82, which is laid over, and we're going to have House File 84, which is for future consideration. So if there's no other comments, and again, I appreciate that um, you came a distance and Ms. Gilley came a distance to be able to provide information today. So thank you for doing that. And House File 84 will be um, uh, laid over for future consideration. And with that, um, thank you all for attending today and um, let's, let's do what we can to make life better for many people. So with that, meeting adjourned. <laughs>